Good evening everyone and welcome to Mingala Studios or welcome back to Mingala Studios for some of you um, for tonight's In Conversation event with Natasha Gordon. As many of you know, my name is Matthew McFedrick and together with Lucy Jeffrey, we have organised the Race and Performance Today series here in the department. And this evening marks our second In Conversation event of the term. Our opening talk saw the playwright and poet Inua Elams discuss his collaborations with Fuel and the National Theatre towards the genesis and production of his international smash hit play, Barbershop Chronicles. As well as an in-depth discussion about the play and some of his latest poems, which I'm sure many of you will remember, um, Inua offered a very personal account of his family's experience of the UK's immigration system and the relationship between race and the British theatre sector today. The series has aimed to create a vibrant platform in the university for students, staff and the public to celebrate and recognise the increasing diversity in the UK theatre sector. Recently, scholars and students have identified the under-representation of different races across literature and theatre programmes in several universities, particularly through movements such as Why Is My Curriculum So White?, as Michael Peters identifies, this is a fundamental educational challenge that has not been addressed by the educational establishment. In this department, we have a tradition of diverse and inclusive syllabi. Previous, previous iterations of core modules, including um, Introduction to Theatre, have examined no theatre, Peking Opera, and playwrights such as Debbie Tucker Green and Lorian Hansbury, for example. But the aim of the Race and Performance Today series is to promote what is happening now. Both Natasha and Inua epitomise the current momentum and excitement surrounding black British theatre in the UK. And hearing from them has not only engaged our students, broadened their wider learning experience, but also revitalised the way in which playwrights of different races are introduced to this department's curriculums. This provides us with all the essential multicultural perspectives when we need them most. With these pedagogical considerations in mind, we are very lucky to welcome tonight's speaker, Natasha Gordon. Natasha is a performer and playwright with her performing credits including Red Velvet at the Tricycle Theatre, Clubland at the Royal Court, As You Like It with the RSC and Class for the BBC, to name but a few. And as many of you in the audience will know, um, and will have seen firsthand, um, she wrote and recently performed in Nine Night, which was first presented to sell-out audiences at the National Theatre, before transferring to, to the Trafalgar Studios in London's West End. Nine Night was equally well received by theatre critics, with Michael Billington, for example, describing Nine Night as a highly impressive debut play before praising its ability to inhabit two cultures and to acknowledge one's ancestral past while living fully in the present. Natasha and Nainat have since been recognised with a number of theatre awards and nominations, including the Critics' Circle Award for Most Promising Playwright, a, a category she also won at the recent Evening Standard Theatre Awards. And while Nainat, just this past week, has also been nominated for two Olivier Awards, including Best New Comedy. Extraordinarily, with the 2018 transfer of Nine Night, Natasha also became the first black British female writer to have a play staged in the West End. And yes, just to clarify, I did say 2018 at the beginning of that sentence. This significant but also humbling fact reminds us how Natasha is breaking new ground for black British female writers and how she is at the forefront of promising changes within the British theatre sector today. Finally, we would like to say, as a matter of concluding this introduction, um, a huge thank you to the Department of Film, Theatre and Television and the Diversity and Inclusion team at Reading for supporting tonight's event. Lucy and I were keen that as many people um, could attend this event as possible and we're particularly pleased that so many of the student body are represented here tonight. Um, 
For a bit of housekeeping, I'm sure many of you are aware, but fire exits are located through the door that you just entered in, but also stage right or audience left at the very back. Um, and once again, everyone is very welcome here tonight, and thank you very much for coming. But without further delay from me, I'd like you to um, join me in welcoming Natasha Gordon and Lucy Jeffrey to the stage. Thank you, Matt. And just to echo Matt's comments, it is wonderful <clears throat> to see so many friends and students here today. Natasha, welcome to the Bulmish Theatre at the Thank University you. of Reading. Just to give everyone a little bit of context of Natasha's visit, this year we added Natasha's play Nine Night to the curriculum for introduction to theatre to explore issues surrounding uh, race and representation in British theatre, which we might talk about in a little bit more detail shortly. But I'd like to begin by asking you about your learning. Natasha, perhaps we could start at the beginning. Sure. I was wondering if you could speak about your British Jamaican upbringing in terms of the literature and stories you heard and read growing up. Mm, that's a good one. Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's, I mean, that's really, uh, it's such a good question because I think the assumption is made that when you are a writer that you've had influence in your your upbringing from you know a literary mm. influence um, which wasn't the case with me at all um, I was raised single-handedly by my mother that raised me and my brother and she had a job looking after the elderly and worked really long shifts um, so there was no sense of you know bedtime mm. stories mm. or um, you know, passing on stories from her from her family. Uh, you know, it was really that you went to school to learn, and it was school that you you got your your literary knowledge. Um, and the only thing that we had, the only books we really had in the house, were two massive encyclopedias, <laughs> because you know she wanted us to learn and she wanted us to study, but didn't really realise that two massive encyclopedias <laughs> was not the way to help your children to tackle no Harry literature, Potter. no <laughs> Harry Potter, and she didn't have the time, right? And it was going to um, my brother, so my brother's uh, seven years older than me, and it was going to one of his parents' evening uh, that his English teacher took out a book of stories from Anansi. Mm -hmm. And I think, I'm trying to remember how old I was, I was probably age seven. That was the first book or collection of stories that I remember reading and remember being, I wouldn't have been able to articulate it at the time, but there was something about a white woman handing to my family mm. a book about stories that come from an African mm. folklore and culture that sort of opens mm. something up inside. Um, and I'm a slow reader as well, so you know, it was never, books were always a chore for me. Um, so it was really much later on that when I was in secondary school probably and I started to discover plays because you could read them much more quickly mm. and there's a, uh, a, a sort of a visceral, um, a visceral connection to a play that is less cerebral mm. um, that I s started to mm. discover and appreciate the, the power of the spoken word. Mm. So what then were your early experiences of seeing and first performing in theatre, like having had this enthusiastic enjoyment of reading plays? Well, it was just, you know, amazing to me. So probably the, the first ever play I performed was um, the, the Queen of Bodicea, or Song of the Dark Queen, that's what it's called, based on uh, Bodicea. And it was a production that my drama school teacher when I was 13 or 14, mm. took to Edinburgh. And for me, it just being able to use words to 
express mm. emotion, energy, dialogue um, in a safe space. Yeah. It, you know, I remember that being uh, a kind of a moment of waking up, I suppose, and realizing there was a way to experience words that was something other than sitting and reading yeah. a book. And then did you find that enhanced later on as you started to think of this as a profession that you'd go into? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was uh, again, it was the same drama teacher that encouraged me, encouraged me to go to drama school. I'd never heard of drama school, didn't know what it was. Um, I had... I'd gone to drama, uh, not drama school, but I'd done some drama lessons with Anna Cher, who used to run a drama club in North London. And Anna Cher's approach was all completely improvisational, so no text at all. Um, but it was, yeah, much later on being at drama school that I sort of immersed myself more in, mm. you know, different works by, you know, from Pinter to... Ibsen yeah. to, mm -hmm. you know, August Wilson. Okay, so a huge variety of... A oh. huge, a huge variety, yeah. 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 And so how then did that move into you starting to, to create theatre? Did you have these ideas and want to write them down early on or...? No, never. Mm. I always, I always just wanted <laughs> to be an actor. You know, that thing, you go to drama school and... Um, you know, whatever age you are, I was 21 when I started. Mm -hmm. And for me, I just wanted to act because um, that was that was something that I understood. I yeah. knew how to do that, I understood how, how that worked. Uh, and when I left drama school, I was, you know, really lucky for the first seven seven to eight years where I pretty much worked constantly. I was on tour lots. Mm. Uh, and then I sort of got to this point where I was no longer sort of young enough, sort of age, mm. you know, 28. No longer, I no longer looked young enough to play the sort of mouthy South <laughs> Londoners that I was going up for. <laughs> and then I didn't look old enough to sort of upgrade to the mother roles. Mm. And so the work started to dry up and become much less interesting like i would always if i was going up for a tv job it would always be to be you know the support to mm -hmm. the lead um mm -hmm. or even in theater it was always it was never it was never the lead roles it was always about supporting or you know being part of an ensemble which i absolutely love but at the same time there was this frustration that after this three years of intense classical training that I felt like I wasn't being allowed to explore my craft. Mm. Um, and a very good actress friend of mine, Sharon Duncan Brewster, that lots of you would recognise, she sort of gathered together me and a few of her other actress friends, all of a similar age, all sort of, you know, over 40 or approaching 40, and just gathered us together and just said, you know, is it just me or... Um, does it feel like the parts are becoming less interesting the mm. older we get? Mm. Um, and if that's the case, are we happy with that? Mm. No. Uh, what can we do about that? Mm. And one of the things we decided to do about that was to come together every four to six weeks and support each other. And, you know, first of all, just to get out, you know, gripes mm. and groans about injustices in the business. And then it sort of evolved from there to hold on, we've been doing this job for 20 years, there must be something else in our skill set that we want to explore. So that was the first time that I picked up a pen and decided to wow. have a go at writing. I didn't even know it was going to be a play. I was just writing a few scenes, voices that I could hear in my head. And I'd always had this fascination between the difference between a Jamaican funeral and British funerals that I've been to. Um, you know, they're polar opposites, just down to the, the basics in terms of the length. You know, I go to British funerals, uh, predominantly the ones I've been to have been cremations, the whole service is over in half an hour. <laughs> you go to a Jamaican funeral, a half an hour you, you just greeted people. <laughs> um, 
And so I had this thing at the back of my mind that I wanted to do something about that, but didn't mm. know, didn't feel like I had the tools to be able to explore mm. what that was. So it was through this group, we called ourselves the brunch discussion because we would meet at 11 <laughs> o'clock. Brilliant. And you know, for ages we tried to think of a different name but couldn't come up with one, come up with one so just left it at the brunch. Mm. <laughs> and um, I would bring scenes to the group and we would read them. The other actors would give me notes. I'd go away and write a bit more and then put them down. And then my grandmother passed away. Mm. And that was, so this, we're talking coming up for five years ago now. And that was the first time that I experienced Nine Night and was completely blown away by the force of this tradition and yeah. couldn't quite believe that I didn't know anything about so, it. So for some audience members who might not have had the good fortune to see Nine Night, could you explain the ritual? Yes. So the ritual is, it's nine nights of mourning that takes place before the funeral. It can be after. I mean, the thing is with Nine Night, there are no rules per se. It's, it's a flexible um, tradition. But at the heart of it, it's the family and friends of the deceased coming together to celebrate the, to celebrate the, the life of the deceased. Um, but it, it takes on this other element in that it's really important that the spirit goes well so the the thinking behind it is that it's on the ninth night that the spirit will return to the house and it's up for up to the family and friends to help the spirit to move through the house and pass on to the other world wherever that other world may be, whatever the other world means to you. But there's that sense that you don't hold on to the, to the dead energy, you let, you let the energy go. So it's essentially, it's a celebration where people come together, they tell stories about the deceased, they drink, uh, they eat food, there's lots of eating, there's lots of drinking. Um, <laughs> And I wrote the play as a way to kind of explore my own feelings about mm. it, because I found the whole thing completely overwhelming and didn't know what yeah. to expect. Yeah. yeah. So it was, it was necessary then, perhaps, on a personal level, for you to write this, but also for us to see this, to get a chance to be introduced to this, yeah. this ritual. That's, that's absolutely amazing. I imagine that... Um, on that more political side, the mm. Windrush generation and the news from the Home Office in mm. 2014 um, must have been really in your mind and in your, in your heart when, when writing the play. Were you aware of the political weight that it would carry? Because it's quite a prescient moment. No, it, the, 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 uh, it is coincidence. Right. So when I wrote the play, the, the scandal hadn't blown up um, I mean the Guardian I think had been reporting mm. on it um, but it, it hadn't blown up to the scandal that it turned into last year um, but I suppose what we can take from that is that you know some of the themes that I'm exploring in the play mm. is this thing about being a second generation Jamaican mm. and how wherever you're from actually when you're a second generation always that conflict between holding on to your parents culture and rituals mm. and what they pass on to you but at the same time you're having to find your own way here so you're a little bit of them and you're a little bit of here and you're a little bit of this and you're a little bit of that and you're constantly mm. working out and recalibrating how you fit in and where your voice um mm. fits so i I remember the, the the point that the scandal hit. I had just been tackling in rehearsals with a line that Lorraine has in the last scene where um, she says to Trudy, her half-sister, about her mother Gloria, she says, um, 
or she says to Trudy, you know, you were right not to come to England. Um, Mum wanted you, but England didn't. And it was a line that always, it never sat easy with me. And I think it never sat easy with me because it suddenly felt like a quite a big political theme mm. that I wasn't covering anywhere else. Mm. And I sort of tussled with how, how, how much can this line sit in this domestic piece and not yeah. take it off track? And I remember saying to the actress at the time, because I played Lorraine in the West End but not at the National, and I kept saying to her, you know, just bear with me, I'm going to do something about that line because it's not quite... Yeah. It's not quite it. And then, of course, the scandal hit. And, you know, we all went, no, absolutely, that, that line has to absolutely stand as, as it is. Yeah, I mean, its implications with regard to immigration and diaspora communities uh, really uh, makes a, packs a punch. It's, mm, it's, mm. it's an important... You're right, it's an important line that, that does stand out. And I suppose true strands that maybe we could talk about mm. as the intercultural hybridity that you're mentioning, yourself being uh, British Jamaican, mm, mm, and mm. the intergenerational conversations. Um, was any of your own upbringing coming to the fore when you were writing? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, you know, my mum is highly spiritual, I would say, over being highly religious. Um, and, you know, she would tell me things um, about her upbringing that would just seem so odd and so strange. So, you know, um, so her grandparents were Maroons. The Maroons uh, fought the British for their... Maroons were slaves that fought the British for their independence. And she would say things about her grandfather speaking in his native tongue and um she'd talk about him flying up he would he would get into a um uh, not frenzy what's the word a trance and he would easily fly up into a tree and mm. it would be for his wife her grandmother to coax him down speaking their native tongue but my grand but my mother never learned now you could imagine growing up here yeah. being told this stuff yeah. was not something that you could then go to the playground and <laughs> chat to with your friends yeah. about it was yeah. just too <laughs> too weird yeah. and you know there would be rituals that she would have about how you would hang the washing up on the washing line she would go mad if she came out and saw that a t-shirt was hung the wrong way round she would go mad because that would disturb the spirits yeah. so there were all, all these sorts of yeah. you know um super natural elements to my childhood that were never explained yeah. they were just sort of you know put put yeah. out there um so in the last scene of the play where, and for those people that didn't see it, a part of the nine night tradition and disorientating the spirit is that on the ninth night you go into the deceased's bedroom and you rearrange their furniture so that they'll be disorientated when they return. And this was something that my mum mm. wanted to do. But my granddad still alive and with us um, me and my siblings felt really uncomfortable about mm. about mm. doing that but it was really important th to my yeah. mum that we did it anyway we didn't because we were just like mum there's no way we can go into granddad granddad's bedroom and start moving his furniture around when he's just lost his wife of 50 odd years um, and that was the that was the first time that I really felt like a huge clash mm. between our cultures and understanding mm. um, and I just remember feeling like I had really let her down which I still feel a bit really because mm. you know at the end of the day we didn't do that mm. um, but then it was also strange because she'd never 
she never explained any of these mm. rituals. And I think there is something as well about when you're an immigrant and you, especially for my mum's generation, the Windrush generation even more, when you come to a country and you're trying to fit in mm. and you're trying to assimilate, then you don't make so much reference to mm. how things were. Mm back home you're just trying to get on get your head down mm. and make it work make yeah. it work for your family or yeah. well, certainly that was you know my family's choice yeah largely i've been thinking about it and it seems to be about passing on from generation to generation as you're saying a lot to do with mothers and daughters mm. um or, or aunts and nieces with gloria or aunt maggie lorraine mm -hmm. anita and then Anita's daughter, Rosa, yes. and the, the sense of continuing that, um, and also that space of, of what the home actually is as you go on from generation to generation, mm -hmm. the, the consciousness of your culture and how rooted you then feel in your home, whether you feel it adopted or mm. is your home, mm -hmm. and how much then do you, do you put the idea of immigration at the heart of Nine Nights when you were writing it? Um, well, I guess subconsciously it had to have been leading me the whole way mm. because it starts with Gloria that has travelled from Jamaica um, and Lorraine and Robert's generation is my generation. Mm. So I'm looking at, you know, what it means to uh, fight back in yeah. a different way to Gloria's generation mm. um which is really reflective i think of you know what we've seen in society for mm. um you know my generation that have gone actually no we're not just gonna fit in and shut up we are going to challenge the status quo oh, yes. um and it's not something that is referenced so much in Nine Night because essentially it's a play about grief, but certainly yeah. those, you know, those themes are sort of skirting yeah. around yeah. the outside. I made a note here of um, Anita dealing with this, this struggle when she talks about everyone jamming in the room and making a space for her. Mm. And that wonderful realist set full of colour, full of vibrancy and life and I wondered how your work with Raja Shakri, the designer for Nine Nights, mm. um, helped you develop this sense of space and home. Um, well, I showed Raja photos from right. my grandparents' home, and you know the, that look is—I uh, mean, it's iconic. I mean, it's different because this is the. This is the kitchen. Um, so typically what you have in a Jamaican household, you would have a front room that would almost be like the museum piece. <laughs> and it's where all the crockery is from the <laughs> wedding or, you know, your the things you've bought with your hard-earned cash. And it all is in display in a glass cabinet. And it's not to be touched. It is only <laughs> to be looked at. Um, you know, and there are ornaments all over the place. Um, so uh, because it was set in the kitchen, mm. then I guess it's mine and Raj's cheat of how much you could bring yeah. the living room element to the to the kitchen yeah. space. So you can see that there is a glass cabinet uh, just behind mm. the, the table there. Yeah. Um, but it is a it is a room that most people from the Caribbean would look at and completely, completely recognise, yeah, I think. Absolutely. Um, I mean, in places, you get a sense of it from this image. The play is so joyous and it's hilarious. And I think the comedy is a really important facet, as you say, in a play that's dealing with loss and mm, grief. Mm, mm. And I wondered how much of the tone of the play was shaped by the director, um, Roy Alexander Weiss. I hear that he um, would often start with dance warm-ups or introduce games and music into rehearsals. Um, yes, so 
I mean, in terms of the the comedy, then that's those are the sounds. You know, yeah. the the dialogue is what I've grown, what I've grown up with. Um, we had a fantastic movement director, mm. Shelley Maxwell, that is Jamaican, and it she just brought with her this extra added element that I could only have dreamt of really because she's grown up in the nine night tradition and the Kumana dance which is the dance that takes place after that moment Shelley knew really well because she'd grown up dancing it and then studied it at, at dance school um, so she would lead a warm up every morning right. and the the warm-up would be you know really general to begin with and then the last five minutes we would come together and do the the kumana um she'd also brought in with her two fantastic drummers that go to funerals and uh, funerals and nine nights and play the the African drums um, as part of the, the Kumana ceremony. And so we had this amazing session where they came in and they spent two hours with us mm -hmm. and talked us through the ritual and showed us the the dance. Mm -hmm. And it was it was such a fantastic moment for us because it, it suddenly embedded embedded the whole ritual into something really real like you after they after the end of that two hour session you felt as though the ancestors were in the room with us which was the whole which was exactly what i wanted to achieve for anita that moment yeah. when she's in that nine night room that she comes out and she expresses to us something that she's experienced back there that we haven't been party to or certainly Lorraine mm. hasn't been yeah, party yeah. to because she's still so locked mm. in her yeah. traditional grief let's I say. mean for an audience you really get a terrific sense of that rhythm and energy and it's just a joy in those moments especially when Anita is is dancing and, and swirling around by the by the back door it's it's a wonderful moment mm. something that really struck me when i first saw nine night at Trafal trafalgar studios was the audience demographic mm. and in the moment where trudy who's wearing the striped top uh comes in and opens her suitcase and takes out the the mangoes, rum. the of course the Actually, rum, many a rum, many a rum. <laughs> um, and the sweet potatoes, the plantains. People in the audience around me were saying these words aloud. Yeah. It was such a familiar culture mm. to them. And for me, as a Welsh British theatre goer, I was I was not familiar mm. with this. And then I I read a review by Paul Taylor in the Independent that said that the play generates an atmosphere of inclusion. And that's certainly true. We, we all experience loss and we have a connection with one or many of the characters. But I was very aware that I was outside of mm. a community that I, I hadn't previously had access mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. And it was a fantastic experience for me, therefore, to be engaged with this. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, did you have an audience in mind when you were writing Nine Nights? Um, so it's really, it's, I was in both a fortunate and unfortunate position in that when I wrote Nine Night, I wasn't writing it for the National Theatre. Mm. So I was writing it for myself. I was writing it because I needed to, uh, to get this feeling out of being a second generation coming to the first time to this tradition that I had no um, previous knowledge of. So that also gave me freedom because I wasn't thinking about censoring myself. I wasn't thinking about making the patois mm. understandable for a national theatre traditional audience. It was purely an inner expression for me. Mm. Um, so I wasn't thinking about an audience in mind until obviously okay. I hear that the, the national want to do it. And then, of course... I started to panic um, <laughs> and I started to panic because you know exactly that knowing what uh, a national theatre audience looks like typically um, you know the worry about how much would they 
understand how much would they be able to um, connect to the characters and the experience and then knowing that the, the reality of the uh, uh, Jamaican and Caribbean and African um, people that I would want to see it probably wouldn't get to the mm. national um, in time anyway mm. before the end of the run as it was only a five week run so I mean, marketing worked really hard to make sure that the posters went out into the right places and into the community. Um, and, you know, I remember the, the feeling in the first preview of being in the auditorium <coughs> at around 7.24 and looking around and seeing a traditional national theatre audience and thinking okay. <laughs> here we go um, and then and um, I kid you not it was at around 727 that suddenly diversity wow. walked through the door wow. um, <laughs> and kept you waiting <laughs> completely um, and it was just the most incredible it was already an experience for me to just sit and watch to see how many people of colour were in that audience. And when I use that term, I don't mean to offend anybody. Mm. It's also because I can't quite bear BAME and haven't quite worked out what the expression should be. Mm. So if I say people of colour, then you know, we understand mm. what, I, what I mean. Um, and so for me, the play had already begun sitting in the audience and going, oh my God, word has spread because what I expected might happen is that word would spread towards the end of the run. Mm. But it was, you know, it was right there from the beginning. And I sat and I watched that first preview and no offense to the actors, but I have to say, I was just mostly looking around the room in the auditorium and watching the different responses is you had some, you know, black people rolling around in laughter, like <laughs> hitting the, the bars and the, the chairs in front of them. And, you know, a more traditional audience watching <laughs> that experience taking place <laughs> around them. and then you know looking mm. out front and experiencing something that they felt outside of mm. but were still able to connect to the sense of family cool. and you know grief being such a universal story yeah. there is something mm. there is something in that story that that you can connect yeah. to, whether you get all the patwa, whether you get the essence of the patwa, yeah. we know what those relationships, yeah. what they yeah. look like. Absolutely, and it, it was the joy that was delivered from the stage into the audience that certainly made it a wonderful learning experience for me and mm. also a very fun evening at the theatre. And I continue to learn because I noticed that in the programme there's a recipe for Guinness punch. <laughs> and I'm just wondering if you can make a mean rum cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> or help me with mine. I can certainly help you with yours, Lucy. Well, it's a thing I can. I mean, this is what I mean sometimes about suddenly turning so British. Like, I haven't made a mean Guinness punch for years. <laughs> Yes, it is something that I would have every Sunday as part of my, you know, yeah. rice and peas and yeah. chicken. And, you know, there's a lot of Guinness in Guinness Punch. There's <laughs> quite a bit of rum in Guinness Punch. And this would be something yeah. I'd be drinking from, like, age dot. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Prompt off with the idea of some milk in there as well, yes. I hear. Yeah. <laughs> I'm well, happy more, to help you out with yours. I think just more rum. Just really, more rum, yeah. exactly. <laughs> On, on a more serious note, on the one hand, I think we should celebrate the fact that you are the first black British female playwright to have a play on at the West End. It's a tremendous achievement. But on the other hand, it's quite unsettling that it's 2018, or was 2018, when this first happened. Mm. I mean, how do you feel about this? It's a very bittersweet experience really i was saying to lucy that the first time i heard that was the case was 
from the playwright Winston Pinnock. Um, and we were having a very <coughs> casual conversation and it was after the play finished in the Dorfman um, and she asked if there was any future plans for the play and I said, and I, I wasn't actually supposed to say it at that point because it hadn't been announced yet, and, but I said, it looks like we're going to get a, a West End transfer. Mm. And Winston turned to me and said, you do realise that will make you the first black British female playwright to have a play on in the West End. And my mouth just dropped. Mm. Um, and I sort of said to her, Winston, that's not, it's, it's impossible. And I sort of went, you know, who, who can we ask? Who would know this? Who, you know, where can we get clarification about that? Because that's just not possible. Um, and there I was, you know, sat next to a fantastic established playwright of 20 odd years mm -hmm. asking who we should check in with, <laughs> whether, you know, that, whether that was the case. So, uh, and it immediately made me feel sort of sick inside and then immediately very angry. It was, mm. it, it was a while before it was anything that I could celebrate, really. Mm. Um, and I only celebrate it in the vein of, um, I see it as a collective achievement. Mm. I see it as the achievement of the Winston Pinnocks and the Debbie Tucker Greens um, and the uh, Bola mm. Agabages um, that have worked for years and because of their excellence that has mm. paved the path for me to be able to be labelled mm. as the first but for me more importantly it's you know, when we're talking about the second, the third, the fourth, that is when we're talking about real progress. Yeah. That generosity of spirit that you shared is, is really tremendous and quite empowering, I think, um, maybe even to people in this room thinking about working on their own productions and plays. More broadly then, where do you think we are in terms of Britain's relationship to representations of race in its theatres? We're getting better, yeah. there is no <laughs> doubt that we're getting better because I'm here, right? So we're definitely getting better and Inua was here. Yeah. Um, but we have a long way to go. I mean, I've, I've just come back from New York and in New York, the theatre scene, in terms of diversity and the canon of work by African-American playwrights, it is completely different. You're seeing work being produced by African-American playwrights all the time. And that was a revelation to me to go and experience last week. And I think they would themselves say that this is... Um, that this is a breakthrough for them too. But even if it is a breakthrough for them too, it's still happening on a much larger scale than mm. it is happening here. Yeah. So, you know, we, we're doing better, but yeah. we've, got, we've got a long, long way to go. Yeah. To pick up that thought on you being here, one of the ongoing initiatives in this department is to deliver modules that are appropriately inclusive and diverse mm. and then to bring the conversation full circle, picking up on Matt's introduction. What do you think of the project of British universities in terms of broadening, broadening their curriculum? It's excellent. Mm. It's a, it can only be excellent and therefore end up truly changing the landscape. I mean, when I was at drama school, 20 years ago you know when i say we looked at august wilson it was really uh, a, a tiny part of the module i think that we we looked at the history of theater mm. but i you know as an as an influence i learn much more about the structure of um pinter and ibsen mm. and beckett you know Shakespeare, 
all, of course, incredible playwrights, but there was nothing like this mm. when I was at drama school. Mm. And therefore, even though I had the most incredible experience, it was also really difficult because I turned myself inside out in order to try not to feel constantly like I was on the outside mm. of an experience. Mm. Um, so that universities are addressing that yeah. and not putting lip service to it, but actually putting on these modules is, mm. is incredible. So do you have any advice for us to, uh, to keep doing it and to, to get better at it? But is that a bit of an unfair question to put you on the spot? <laughs> well, it's a huge question. I mean, yeah. I think you're already doing fantastic things in that you're taking your students to see what's out there um, and, seeing, and taking first them hand, to yeah. see it. So they're, yeah. they're getting that first-hand experience. Um, and you know, going to all theatres yes. really, and not just it, not just being London centric either, but going to the regionals. Um, I think that's really important. Absolutely. And you know, getting people in as yeah. much as you can. I mean, it, you know, it sounds like you're you're doing the things that that you should be doing to make the the difference. But I will definitely have a think about it if any, you know, well, if things that, come that to me. We're, then we're lucky then. I will for sure. Give us some ideas. Thank you. Well, before I continue to bombard you with unfair <laughs> questions, can I open it out to the audience? Because I'm sure that students and colleagues have so many things to ask. So if you just pop your hand up. Sophie. Uh, can I ask a little bit more about your choice to include a white character in the narrative of the play? Great question. Um, so, for me, growing up in my family, having a white person is, has always been a part of my family. Um, so, you know, like lots of people have said to me, it, it's been interesting introducing a white character as... Uh, almost as like the outsider that we learn for, a, an audi for an audience that is not Caribbean, that we learn about the tradition through her, um, which was never really my intention. Um, I, uh, and I think it goes back to the Windrush generation assimilating when they came to this country and you know, there being mixed relationships in this country from the, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s. So that when I look at a Caribbean family, I never see just a, a sea of black faces. I see people from everywhere. Um, so that's what Sophie represents for me. She represents the assimilation that that happens um, when two cultures come together and what's interesting is that in one of the one of the early drafts uh, a director friend that I'd sent the play to really questioned the use of Sophie and sort of said I, I don't think you need her and I really tussled with that for a while and in the end I sort of went I think the point that I'm taking is I'm not quite earning her on the page. So if I do have this white character in this black family, then I need to be really clear about what, why she's there, what she's saying, and what she's representing. Does that make sense? Thank you. John? Do you have a particular creative process? a thing you usually do or um, yeah, a method that helps you build plays? Um, so this is my first play so I haven't quite discovered a process yet but what I know is helpful is being able to be in the world of the play for 
four consecutive days before I take my head out and do anything else. Um, there is, there's kind of something about the accumulation of thinking in the world of that allows me to deepen the voices or deepen the experience that I'm trying to, that I'm trying to convey. Um, what else? I mean, sometimes things come to me having a run, you know, getting out. I think I spend a lot of time thinking before I actually get down to writing, which means by the time I come to sit down to write, there's actually, there's a lot more than I think that's going to kind of come out in this splurge on the page, if that makes any sense. Um, and yeah, I'm just trying to think. I think it's because I haven't really discovered what my process is. I'm sort of learning that. I'm learning that now, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. To the back. I can't see in the light. Is it, is it Kylie? Is that right? Yeah, so it is? Okay. All right. Um, so, like Lucy was talking about, um, some members of your audience unfamiliar with Jamaican culture. Was there any, like, parts of the play when you heard that it was going on national, besides Patois, that you thought they might struggle with or feel alienated by within your work? <coughs> yeah, completely. Um, but in the end, I thought, well, do you know what? Especially for a national theatre audience, if they were to go and see a Chaucer and come out and understand Chaucer, you know, <laughs> most of them would give themselves a pat on the back, you know, at how well they did at tuning in their ear. And I think the, the, the patwa is exactly the same in that respect. It's just... You just have to tune in. Yeah. Or, you know, when you sit down and you watch Shakespeare, you know, the first, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes, you're, you know, you're recalibrating and your, your, your ear is finally... You know, it's like all your senses, everything becomes heightened to be able to grasp onto and capture the experience. And for me, making an audience work hard is, is really important. Beach. Um, I want to know what your experience was playing as Lorraine, and I guess with that comes the question of how much of you was in her and how much of her was in mm, you. Mm, mm, mm. Um, so it was hard, uh, and lots of assumptions I had made about learning the lines. I mean, generally, as an actor, I learn lines quite quickly. Lorraine's probably the hardest part I have ever learned. Um, and there was something about, as the writer, thinking that I knew a general sense of, uh, you know, one of her speeches. And then realising when I get up on my feet that actually I hadn't quite made the link between one word joining and the mm. and the next. Um, it was also hard because it was you know some some of her is so close to home because she's my voice questioning the tradition. So when you don't have that distance, it's also your perspective can become you know skewed. So it was a real, it's you know, definitely the most challenging part I've ever played. But then here's the beauty of being an actor over being a writer, is that when you're, in an, when you're an actor, you're in a room, in a scene with other people. So it's never just about you. You have your co-workers mm. to, to rely on. And... <laughs> Uh, as an actor, my process, which is similar to being a writer, is thinking about what I'm trying to get from the other person in the scene. What, what's the action that I'm actively mm. trying to achieve? And as soon as you do that, you take the pressure of how am I doing? And you're just thinking about what you're trying to do. So, it, you know, whenever I would feel 
panicked or overwhelmed, then you know those are the tools that I would sort of take myself back to. But it was also, you know, the most incredible experience to be able to speak my own words. Mm -hmm. And there came a point where I stopped seeing it as my own words. It became, you know, an acting job like any other acting job. I can't promise to play Sophie, but could you give us a little bit of Lorraine now? Would that be all right? I, yes. I know that you've left you? Nine Nights Behind, <laughs> so I've got a... I've got you've a got copy. a bit in mind. I ha I ha up to you entirely. Um, I know it's plenty to choose from, but, um, but have a flick through. How cruel I'm being. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, what should I... Has anybody got any ideas about which bit I should do? Anybody that's seen the play? Go on, dive in. Maybe that it's not about money bit or somebody else's? It's not about money? Yeah, later on. Um, okay, maybe, as I don't have my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I've said you're perfect. Oh, so sorry. No, not at all. Uh, so let's see what I can remember of. It's not about money, Robert. It's not about money, Robert. Look at her. I know exactly what she wants, but I don't know what she's going to do with it. All of that bitterness blistering inside of you. You sent her from this life to the next carrying shame. You can't do any more. She was sick for months. Where were you? She asked me over and over, truly Khan, truly coming. I've always been rubbish at lying, but my God, I got good at it by the end. Have you ever seen disappointment on a dying face? It's not like she didn't try and make it up to you. When Alvin left, she sent for you. Finally, she could have the family she always wanted. She called you up, begged you to come, didn't she? Can't you remember? We do, don't we, Robert? Oh, just completely <laughs> looking at you, going, I'm not that's quite embodying the Roberts. <laughs> Wonderful, a real treat. I'll have to work on that. Um, <laughs> any more questions from the audience? Just here. Um, you mentioned uh, coming together with a group of fellow actors and, and workshopping the script with them. How does one get the best out of a similar arrangement? The best out of? Out of a similar arrangement. You mean gathering a group of friends to read your work? Um, yeah, or just, just um, having a group on which to... Um, I so these are actresses that I completely trust. You know, we've been friends for a long time, and I think the most important thing when you show somebody your piece of work or you're getting advice, feedback, is that they are people. Doesn't matter how much, how long you've known them but they are people whose opinions you trust. Um, and that's something, that's something that's harder to call because it's about the gut instinct. You want people to understand your work, your vision, your voice as true and as like you as possible. You want to be critiqued, you want feedback, you want them to open out your thinking, but you ultimately, you want them to have understood the essence of what you're trying to, trying to say. Um, so that, that's key for me. <coughs> I mean, I had shown Nine Night to three directors and they all had a completely different response. If it wasn't for one of those directors, then the play may not ever have gone on. 
So, you know, it's it's really important who you show your work to, I think. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. I think Lisa has a question. Yeah, I'm interested in um, kind of British identity and relationship to colonialism and why it seems much harder to have the conversations about um, you know, people of color in when it's British. So we had, for example, Lorraine Hansberry was on the West End in the 60s. Mm. Why is it that like dominant images of what it means to be British don't include diaspora, don't include immigrants, don't include you know, the range of people that actually live here. And um, I, yeah, I guess I'm interested in how your work might kind of speak to that and have you felt an opening up at any point in relationship to that? I'm just trying to unpick the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like, for, like British people can talk about race when it's happening in America. Okay. But it's hard for them to talk Got about you. it as British. Got you. Um, I think it's because of our connection to slavery. I think it's easier to talk about race in America and see the, the story of the African slaves in America different to here because we didn't have slaves in that... Um, uh, immense workforce way on British soil. We had it over in the colonies. So I think that's uh, I think that's key. That's the, you know the key essence to to the problem. Um, and it's it's so it's so difficult because when I speak to a younger generation that have grown up with Black British Month that takes place every October, I get this swelling sense of frustration from them that they also don't want to, uh, they don't want slavery thrown in their faces constantly, that they, they want um, positive, they want a positive connection to their race. And so this is, uh, you know, the, the, the battle and the tension that we always have, because at the same time, I feel like we don't talk about slavery enough and the, the ramifications and how still today, you know, we can see the, the fallout of slavery. It's a very difficult thing to to talk about, um, and I think it's also you know one of the reasons for my mum and my grandparents' generation why they speak less about their 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 African ancestry because you know I remember you know having a conversation or trying to have a conversation with my grandma once about slavery, and she said to me, "I don't know about that," and it was a complete lockdown um, because it's still so painful and it's still so close and we haven't had the same level of movement we haven't had a civil rights movement here in the same way that there has been in the states and so therefore the progression in terms of talking about race is different we are we're still behind. And until we can find a way to get over that, then we're always gonna be at this, you know, at this sticking point. That's a fascinating response. Any more questions? I think Alice, and then Lib. Um, as far as national identity is concerned, obviously quite dual in the fact that we've got Australians and the British. Um, would you ever consider putting this play on outside of Britain, or do you think it is a British play from where you've written it? I would love to put it on outside of Britain. I mean, in actual fact, it has been on at a drama school in Jamaica, oh. um, which I, I, know, I would have loved to have yeah. seen. I think it went really well. Um, uh, I would love to see it in America 
where there's also you know a huge uh, Caribbean population I I'd be really interested to see I mean of course there are certain references like um, my mother-in-law said something like oh you know if it went to if it went and no it wasn't even to do with America if it went outside of London Tash you'd have to take out the bus references because nobody would know the 236 and the 43 <laughs> um, which I don't think I don't think is the case because the point is not the bus numbers themselves it's just the fact that Maggie thinks it's that she needs to name all of these different Auntie Maggie thinks she needs to name all of these different buses. I would love to see the response outside of London and outside of the outside of the UK. I think it'd be really fascinating to see what holds. My sense of it is there are certain things that are specific to growing up in North London, but I think my general sense of it is because it's about grief. I think it would. I think it would it would reach quite far and wide, I think. I hope. Perhaps we have time for just another couple of questions, so we'll go to Lib for hers, and, and then we'll go. Uh, you mentioned fairly quickly... Yes. ..that, and then the National Theatre was lost. <laughs> 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 it's a huge step, it seems to me. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how the National became interested. Mm. Um, and, uh, particularly given that the National Theatre haven't been mm. noted for, mm. uh, I mean, there have been some plays by um, quite a diverse mm. group, but then they're, they're not their record. Common. They're few yeah. and far between. Yeah. Um, so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how the National became interested and the relationship of the director to that process. Sure. Um, so, as I said, I sent the play out to three different directors. One of those directors was Dominic Cook, who's an associate at the National. And I had worked with Dom three times as an actor and, you know, talking about showing your work to people that you can trust. Dom was absolutely one of those people. Um, and so I had this feedback meeting with Dom where he sort of said, you know, I love the play. So that was the first, <gasps> OK. Um, and then he said, uh, I hope you don't mind, but I sent it on to the National Theatre Studio. So that was the second, <gasps> OK. <laughs> um, and then he said, and look, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I'm not saying that it's going to end up on the national stage. But what I'm saying is, is that you've invest, invested enough in this play that I think is a great play that I think the studio should give you a workshop. So um, <clears throat> I got in touch with the studio and I think within a month, I was in doing a workshop uh, with a different dire uh, director, with Indu Ribasingham, that runs the kiln. And we had a two, three day workshop, I think, and then they asked me to go away and write another draft based on that, based on the notes that I received. I wrote another draft, and they came back within six weeks, you know, to two months. I opened my emails and saw. Uh, an email from Emily McLaughlin that is head of new work at the National Theatre Studio saying meeting with Rufus um, and you know yeah. that was the third <laughs> um, and I mean even then at that point seeing the email I, I didn't dare believe that that meeting was sort of saying yes we love it and we want to do it I thought it might be Rufus taking time out to say look this is great. It's not quite there yet. Uh, we'll give you a few more workshops. We'll stay with you, help you to develop it and keep talking about it. And it was my partner that pointed out that Rufus Norris is not going to take time out of his diary to give me a pep talk. Um, <laughs> and it was the most incredible feeling, you know, when, when he said it. I remember saying to him, 
actually, can you just not talk for a minute because I just need to take in what you've said, otherwise nothing nothing will go in. So we did sit in an awkward <laughs> two-minute silence whilst I composed myself. And then as to how Roy became involved, so that was through the National, really. I, I hadn't seen Roy's work. Um, and it was, at the time, it was a tough decision because the directors that I really loved or you know have worked with before who I trust they were all unavailable um, and the the national had been tracking Roy's career for the past couple of years so um, you know they they brought us brought us together and also you know brought on the the lovely and amazing Shelley Maxwell the mm. movement director and so it was a real you know collaboration between the three of us. Wow. You weren't worried it wasn't a woman director? Um, no, I wasn't. And I, I wasn't, uh, for me, it didn't even need to be a black director either. It just needed to be somebody that understood my vision. Uh, there is obviously something really useful with working with somebody that has that cultural shorthand but for me a good director is a good director and they will investigate and interrogate a script in the same way that that anybody would um, i'd love to work with a woman director next time around though that's for sure it'd be well, amazing after the huge success of nine night before you go perhaps i can ask what's next for natasha gordon ho, ho, ho. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I am uh, currently possibly turning Nine Night into a TV adaptation. Wow. Um, but that's, yeah, uh, I'm hesitant about that because it's, it's a long process and writing for TV is so completely different to theatre. So I really do feel like I'm learning from scratch. Um, and I have another uh, commission with the Fantastic. with the national, so I'm just sort of you know looking at what what there is to say next, really. Well, you're keeping a sense of mystery. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I'm very excited to find out what what that will be, and I'm hoping that you can come back again and For sure. talk with us about that should sure. the occasion arise. So would you all please join me in applauding Natasha Gordon.